Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Prescient China update for Q1 2021. Um, today we are joined by Liang Du and Tian Pan, um, based out of Shanghai. Um, Lian, Liang is the CIO and CEO of the Prescient China Fund, and, and Liang joined Prescient in 2005. Tian joined Prescient about six months ago to head up the business development for the China team, um, previously working at Old Mutual and Tao Watson. We're going to be discussing um, two major topics today, um, China's post-Chinese New Year market correction and how many stocks have corrected and historical lessons, key developments for China's latest NPC meeting, and then lastly wrapping up on how prescient China is positioned to, to capture the best and most out of China at the, in the current market. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, please post them through the Q&A functionality and we'll attend to them at the end of the time. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tian and Liang. Thanks very much, Jason. Morning, everyone. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for joining our update session. Uh, I'm going to head straight into, firstly, a COVID-19 update. I think finally we're seeing a much more greener picture uh, across the world map with vaccine rollout. And hopefully with successful vaccine rollouts for the rest of the year, the global economy will start opening up fully in terms of the physical economy and we'll get back to normal, at least pre-COVID 2019 levels. If we look at country statistics, we see the U.S. doing very, very well in terms of population coverage uh, for its vaccine rollout. The U.S. currently running at about three and a half million doses of uh, vaccine administration every day. Um, total uh, doses administered around 200 million um, and population coverage about 30 percent already. China is right behind the U.S. in terms of total number of doses but with a much, much larger population, it's only sitting at around 6.5% population co uh, coverage. Smaller countries such as Seychelles and Israel are doing really well in terms of overall population coverage, but we, we feel the, the U.S. will still be the ultimate benchmark in terms of uh, looking at vaccine coverage. And either way, we feel this is very positive uh, with a strong upward trend and daily doses being administered increasing periodically. Uh, so we are hoping for a much more positive second half of the year in terms of opening up of the economy. Moving on to market and policy updates in terms of China, I think the latest develop developments in China uh, very much focus on China-US relations. Uh, the most recent Alaska meetings uh, a few weeks ago between the two sides, there were no major expectations going into the talks um, and there were no major results coming out of the talks, which was in line with expectations. What we did see in the media, however, were firm words and positions from both sides. And we feel that is necessary as both sides, both parties could not appear weak for their domestic audience. Uh, but what we see as a positive coming out of the talks is that uh, we believe having a quarrel does not mean that China and the US uh, had a failed negotiation. Uh, they still got together and talked. And any dialogue we believe is positive, at least compared to the Trump era. Uh, both sides gave official feedback for the talks being frank and constructive. So we think that that is a positive and hopefully going forward, there will be more uh, interactions and positive developments for bilateral relations between China and the US. In terms of expectations going forward, we expect no immediate reset in bilateral relations compared to the Trump admin administration, but we do expect less unexpected type of political moves compared to the Trump administration, uh, as the Biden administration has a much more seasoned team uh, dealing with foreign policy. We expect geopolitical con competition to continue. Uh, we'll see a lot of noise in terms of Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan, so a lot of noise in the media, putting pressure in terms of public opinion towards China, so topics such as COVID-19 accountability, human rights abuses, we expect to see a lot more of those, but none of those really impacting markets. Uh, so we try and at Prescient try and filter through the, the, the noise, the political noise and focus on solid market data to handle our investments. In terms of areas of cooperation, uh, there are clear areas of cooperation between China and the US such as climate change. And overall, we feel uh, the, the bilateral relations are still in somewhat of a stable state because we feel room for further deterioration in bilateral relations are very, very limited because further deterioration will mean a move towards military conflict. And at current uh, state, uh, we feel it is extremely unlikely. Uh, 
Moving uh, on to uh, some stats, um, talks of global decoupling, we do not believe that it is possible in the immediate future. Uh, this is a chart we pulled for manufacturing GDP of China from 2019. And we can see that China's manufacturing GDP in terms of total physical goods produced, a good representation of physical goods produced is more than the combination of the US, Japan, and Germany combined. We include South Africa in there just to show the scale of the production of China. Uh, so we feel it is not easy to replace China as the, uh, the world's factory yet. And even if decoupling were to happen, it would be a long and lengthy process. Moving on to results of China's NPC meeting. So NPC stands for National People's Congress. It is the highest ruling political body in China. Um, earlier this year, there was a uh, NPC meeting um, for discussions for China's next five-year plan from 2021 to 2025. And some of the key takeouts from the NPC meeting, we believe, are all positive. So first is China wants to incre increase its technological competitiveness. Uh, this is on the back of US sanctions uh, on a lot of tech-related purchases for China. So examples would include Huawei uh, that were sanctioned by the US. So China has targeted domestic investment into R&D at 7% annual growth through to 2025, which is the end of the current five-year plan. Uh, and by 2025, we expect annual R&D spending to be approximately 580 billion US dollars, which is comparable to current US spending on R&D. China wants to focus on self-sufficiency in technology uh, and reduce reliance on the West, uh, which is, has been fast-tracked by recent sanctions. We feel this is positive in terms of China's overall competitiveness as an economy going forward with less external dependencies. China is also focusing on reducing emissions. Uh, so one of the plans it's come out with is that it's got a plan to produce 20 gigawatts of new nuclear reactors, and that approximates to 20 new nuclear reactors. So though not the greenest of energy, much, much cleaner than traditional coal-fired coal power plants, um, it also plans to increase afforestation in the country by about one percentage point. Uh, so the number in percentage terms sounds quite small, but in terms of actual land area, uh, the, that one percent of forestation represents about 11 million hectares for the size of the entire country of, of South Korea. So China really producing some results historically and will continue to focus on green energy and emission reduction. Some more points, China, the Chinese government has signaled that it is more focused on long-term sustainable GDP growth rather than pretty short-term numbers. So 2021 GDP uh, growth expectations of what econo economists consensus is at around 8.4%, but the government has come out with a much lower target of 6% for the year. And that is a clear sign from the government saying we do not want to re necessarily reach the 8.4% if it means that it won't help in terms of long-term sustainable growth. So we feel that is a positive signal from the government. Uh, the government's also targeting a much smaller budget deficit this year at negative 3.2%. So in comparison, as at the end of February, a US budget deficit set at around 16.5% of GDP. So China in much better fiscal state um, than the US. Lastly, monetary policy uh, has been touted to remain consistent. Uh, to both support economic growth and control financial risk. So China has been very prudent in terms of fiscal and monetary stimulus through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and with more consistent monetary policy, we expect liquidity in the Chinese financial system to remain stable and risks in the financial system to also remain as stable as a result. If we just recap quickly for 2020, uh, we can see that China was the only major economy to produce positive economic growth and this year it has continued to expect to produce some solid positive economic growth, driving global economic growth for 2021. Uh, if we also recap uh, benchmark indices for the countries for 2020, we can see China perform much better than its peers globally in US dollar terms, uh, with a much smaller drawdown during the peak of the pandemic in March, April of 2020. Uh, this year, China continues to perform solidly, and the annual cover some detail into the market uh, in the later later in the presentation. Uh, if we look at valuations uh, for the Chinese market, both in terms of equities and bonds, the chart on the left showing PE ratios uh, for the market as at the end of March 2021, we can see that compared to most of its major emerging market peers, 
the Chinese CSI 300 benchmark offers the best value on relative terms. If we look at the two bars on the right-hand side for US equities, the S&P 500 at a 32 PE ratio and the NASDAQ at a whopping 72 PE ratio, showing that the US market valuations are extremely high uh, with the S&P 500 uh, more than 50% higher and uh, the US NASDAQ almost three and a half times higher than Chinese valuation. If we look at the chart on the right hand side, 10 year government bond yields are looking very stable and good value in China offering around 3.2%. Developed market bonds offering much lower yields, although the US yields recently have spiked slightly, uh, reducing the uh, the relative attractive, attractiveness of Chinese bonds. But still overall, Chinese bonds offering much better value in terms of yield. Uh, so I think in summary, we feel fiscal and monetary stimulus right now continues to influence global markets, and we are significantly concerned on market valuations, especially in the US uh, and some of the emerging markets such as Singapore and India. Uh, so when easy market conditions change in terms of fiscal and monetary policy um, and stimulus, uh, we are very worried about some of the valuations that we see in different markets globally. Right now, we believe China is much cheaper uh, and much more reasonable in terms of valuation, and as a result, probably the safest place to be, uh, the safest major market to be right now in 2021. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Liang uh, to take you through the positioning and performance of our portfolios. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, as everyone mentioned, it's been very, very interesting lately. So the first thing I want to share with everyone is that recently there's been a narrative that's been building up, even in Bloomberg's or in general consensus, it goes along the line of something like this. Um, China monetary policy seems to be not easing anymore. It's not being extremely loose. Should you sell out of the China and buy US where they're flooding the world with cheap money and they're flooding the world with fiscal stimulus? So this is a very, very interesting question. Um, so what we did is actually really think through this problem because we think this is truly a really false narrative. So taking us all the way back, the starting point I'll show you guys is you know, when the, what happened in the last great financial crisis? Well, in 2008, with the world ending and Lehman Brothers blowing up and everything, the US and China both came to the market with a world record stimulus, fiscal stimulus at that point in time. And, you know, with the hindsight of history, you can see that the US flushed around $800 billion into their market, and China in 2008 put in $453 billion. Now, the economy of China is much smaller back in the days, and what China did was it put in around 10% of its GDP. In fact, if you include things like, um, you know, the, the velocity effect of the stimulus, closer to about 15% of GDP. At the same time, the US at great financial crisis at that point in time put in around 5.5, 5.6% of its GDP. So much more reasonable amount of stimulus. So what happened then um, when you get to stimulus? Well, something very, very simple happened. With 10% of GDP stimulus, um, the PE ratio of China started from about 13 during the crisis and went all the way up to 33. The USP ratio, of course, also started around 13 at the financial crisis, and with less stimulus, never got as extreme, so it went up to around 23, 24, 25. So the US did a far more reasonable stimulus compared to China, and out of the initial recovery, it looks like China was doing great. So you can see that the Chinese equity market, for example, on the right-hand side, outperformed the S&P by extremely wide margin due to this large stimulus. Now, if stimulus was a be or an end law and such a great idea, then Japan will be one of the most successful countries in today uh, compared to where it is. So after 2010, after this big injection of stimulus, what China was left with was a lot of bad debt, with a lot of borrowing from the future that they had to pay back. So over the next four or five years, the market actually just steadily went down and the PEs got more and more reasonable, all the way from 33, going all the way back down to even below 10, by 2013. And that's because they had to deal with that problem. And the US and vice versa, although their recoveries have been somewhat um, choppy out of the 2009 crisis, by around 2012 has already outperformed the Chinese market in terms of equities. And as we all know, um, that led to one of the strongest um, bull markets in all of history. So going back today, what is happening today? Well, in 2020, to fight COVID, China put in a 690 billion um, stimulus, and that's only around uh, 4% of GDP um, stimulus for COVID. It was able to control COVID reasonably well and didn't want to overstimulate the market. At the same time, the US is currently committed around 5.5 trillion 
This is truly unprecedented. It looks at around 26% of its GDP in the stimulus package. Um, you know, it is very just like China in 2008, where even though China is a growing country, it actually struggled to deploy 10% of GDP stimulus in an effective manner. I do have a lot of doubts that this 5.5 trillion is um, deployed in a very, very uh, efficient manner. And if it's not deployed in an efficient manner, then the end result of the US over the next few years will be the same as China has had in 2010, which is that slowly and surely it will have to pay it all back. And that's exactly what we've seen today. So in 2020, after the stimulus um, on the left hand side chart, which you can see that the USP ratio started around 14 before the stimulus came through and sitting around 34 at the moment. And China, with its more reasonable stimulus, less stimulus, has seen far less of a PE expansion, starting at around 13, but cheaper, and it's only sitting at about 18, 19 P right per second. And before everyone talks about, um, you know, the US has technology, the technology sector makes up around 26% of the S&P 500. In China, the technology sector is smaller, it's about 11% of the CSI 300. But China has a 26% consumer discretionary, consumer stable, um, sector and that consumer sector actually trades at a P of 45. Um, so it can just show you that when you exclude the expensive sectors from either market, both indices will look reasonably um, cheap. And what I'm showing there is that, of course, history never repeats itself, but there's something to consider. Um, we certainly don't think that endless stimulus and endless um, P expansion results in good investment outcomes in the current cycle um, from where we are starting off right now. Right, the second topic I want to talk about is also quite topical in terms of what did people do with all this money creation? Well, um, uh, before we get to that, uh, talking a bit earlier, I also want to show quickly on the economic model, the latest data out of China. Once you take into account the March economic data, what you're actually seeing in China is the strongest econ economy recovery since 2010. Now, I'm trying to understand that part of it is that it did have a stimulus program during COVID, and part of that is recovering off the low base. So it is very, very reasonable that for China to stop its fiscal stimulus right now, uh, given the fact that inflation is starting to pick up and monetary policy is still reasonably easy. So given the fact, do not be surprised that China is not flashing the, uh, the market with massive amounts of money, and because it will make absolutely no logical sense to do so. All you will create is bad debt in the bubble and that you have to pay back far further over the longer term. Um, so we do believe that the policy stance that China has taken um, though not necessarily the most attractive in the short term, is one that's far more sustainable over the long term. Right, um, getting back to the stock market, um, we've spoken about last time about the idea of mania stocks. And earlier on, I just said, you have so much money creation, all of those things. What's happening to all this money? What are people doing with all this money? Well, both in China and the US, what people are doing is buying up um, you know, consumer or tech stocks or stocks that have a good theme and a good um, story, right? So typically what you find is a few stock example here with SF Holdings. Um, well, down here we started at P of 20, going to P of almost 60, high temp flavoring P of 40, going to over 80. So we're looking at an entire portfolio of stocks trading at price to sell of over 10, um, you know, price to equity is of 40 and above, price to earning ratio is of 40 and above, and that's becoming the norm. And active managers have been buying them in a huge scale. Um, so in China, there's over 3,000 stocks in the stock market. 80% of all active managers um, are invested in around these 77 stocks in China. And I don't think this is unique to China. I think in the US, it's exactly the same thing. So you're having this mania stock or momentum stock that's been building up to an extreme level. Um, the next slide just shows some of the earning growth and their PE growth. And although earning growth is somewhat attractive, typically growing at 30 to 50%, the PEs have doubled or tripled over the past year, over a very, very short period of time. And I'm glad to say in the first quarter where China had a minor correction, so the market's only down around 1% in CNY over the quarter, or the inter-quarter, um, the market's up and down in around a 10 to 15% range. Um, what you have seen is that the mania stocks are starting to deflate and the market's becoming more rational, rotating back into the cheaper stock. So although the index level things are quite quiet, mania stocks are starting to deflate. And from our research, we know that these mania stocks on the, in, on the portfolio level, if you put them all together, typically underperform by at least 20%. And that's even not considering the extreme that they've gotten to before. 
So we're starting to see that in China, for example, SF Holding, in 2020, the stock was trading around 40 CNY. It traded all the way up to 120 by Feb before falling down to 60. Luxury precision, similar. A stock that's trading around 20 to 30 CNY at the start of 2020, traded all the way up to 70 before dropping all the way back to 30. So we're starting to see the rotation out of the main stock. And why that's important is because as a plants manager, over the past few years, we, um, you know, we always try to say, stay patient, have a good diversified portfolio, don't get caught up in these things. And what we're seeing now is really kind of the mania stock starting to correct. And that's actually somewhat good for us because number one, we feel like it's a far more sustainable market um, when the market is not you know, dominated by three of these stocks that have been kind of pushed to the absolute extremes. And secondly, as a quantitative manager, we have a very diverse type of portfolio. So we do not have the risks of holding these um, extreme mania stocks in our portfolio. All right, so overall, um, in terms of our equity positioning, we can summarize summarize it by saying we are underweight the mania stocks. We hold a very diversified portfolio. Uh, the average portfolio P is around 17. Um, we have a portfolio that is cheaper than the market. Um, at, at the same time, we're also not having a highly concentrated portfolio of these consumer or tech or mania stocks as we like to hold them. Secondly, we take advantage of future arbitrage opportunities which are still here to outperform. And finally, also just to maintain our strict quantitative risk management framework. So continually to have a portfolio that's safe and can deliver for the long term. In terms of our asset allocation, as we mentioned, where are we sitting right now? Well, um, in terms of economics, the Chinese um, economy is extremely strong. Uh, so we can see that's one of the strongest eco uh, economic performances over the past decade. And so far, everything looks good. Uh, the economy remains very, very strong. Um, with the mania stocks correcting a little bit, we have seen sentiment weaken a little bit. And with the sentiment weakening, we naturally cut some equities in our portfolio. Uh, but we must say the next move um, that we're going to make in our portfolio, we'll be starting to look at increasing our equity exposure once again. Over the last quarter, just to show you guys how quickly we move our, our portfolios, um, when we started December 2020, we were about 82% exposed to equities. Sitting in March 2021, we we're already down to 54% uh, equity uh, due to the changes in the sentiment model mostly. Our sentiment model do move faster than the market, and as such, even over quarter one, we had about 1% alpha relative to 65-35 index. The next slide just shows our equity exposure starting in 82 and how active we are um, you know, as an asset management uh, company, moving our asset allocation over time. We will take care of these things for you um, at a much faster pace than other people can um, by being on the ground here in Shanghai. Um, so overall, once again, um, in spite of tremendous rent strength last year, the rent strength in around 25% last year, and we don't have our funds not denominated in rent on CNY. Um, the funds done around 16% over the past year, over three years and since inception, um, almost over all the time period, we're looking at uh, you know, 16, 17% annualized after all fees, uh, net of all fees, which is an incredibly strong uh, return and very, very high real return, both in the short term and over the long term. Um, we think that, as Tian mentioned, across the world, China is still one of the most reasonably valued markets. It's more expensive than we start with the fund, so we don't think that the real return can be as high as historically has been. Um, but looking across all different markets, looking across stimulus, looking across interest rates, looking across economic performance, we still remain quite comfortable that over the next cycle, China can deliver high real returns. And on top of that, we can deliver alpha uh, with opportunities that we find in China. Um, so we quite like that. So I will open up um, the in the presentation here and open it up for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. There are a few questions coming through. If you do have any more questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, you know, maybe directed at you know the opening to Tian, maybe about you know, people asking about COVID vaccine rollouts. You know, how is the vaccine rollout working in China? You know, is it as efficient as what we've seen around the world? Um, you know, numbers you know show that you guys are number two essentially in, in the race to vaccinate the population. You know, what is the? How does it feel on the ground as a, as a, a user? I would assume. Yeah, so I mean, we're fortunate enough in, in Shanghai to have uh, quite a lot of choices. Um, so there are quite a, uh, sort of at least two to three variants of locally Chinese produced. Um, 
vaccine that vaccines that were initially slower uh, to produce but now is being fully rolled out so as an example in our office block we can register to be uh, to be vaccinated there will be a government uh, arranged bus to take us to a clinic or a hospital where we can get vaccinated at the cost of the government um, our friends uh, recently that returned to south africa went to a clinic uh, that was specifically designed for, for foreigners in shanghai uh, everyone spoke English and they knew exactly the process. Uh, you can get vaccinated, make sure there's no allergic reaction. Uh, so everything is being rolled out uh, for the entire population, it seems here. And uh, I think China's numbers currently at about four and a half million doses across the country per day. And we see that number continually rising uh, until uh, China hits sort of your 60 to 70 percent population coverage needed. Uh, for, for herd immunity. So we're quite positive and we feel uh, there's, there's not really any sort of urgency with, with the good COVID situation in China, but people are starting to um, get on the queue and get, get on the vaccination process. So we're very hopeful that at least China will be opening up to the rest of the world second half of the year. Uh, and we see if we look at the stats uh, in the UK and in the US, uh, they are percentage wise, they're actually way ahead of China in terms of vaccine going out there. So we're very positive uh, on the general vaccine situation for econ economies to open up. I think um, it's very clear that in the beginning, supply was reasonably limited, uh, but I think certainly in mid-April right now, um, they're literally putting people off the streets to get vaccinated. So you can see that the supply has more than caught up, um, especially in tier one cities. Um, I think one, what we can hear, rural areas will get vaccinated at a slower pace. Uh, but certainly all tier one and tier two cities, I think by some of this year, um, China will have vaccinated most of the urban areas. Okay, um, perfect. Um, and then just talking about you know, equity exposure within the fund, um, obviously you, you alluded that you, you're looking at expo um, increasing equity exposure. You know, what, what models are pointing to hold you back of making that call right now? Um, and how quickly can you implement that, that movement? Very good question. So as you can see that we do, we monitor our asset allocation daily. So our sentiment model moves daily and we look at valuation and we look at um, economic policy. So we actually cut literally one day from the peak on the valuation basis. Um, you know, and that's because we had a multiple, we have a valuation um, level that we want to get to before we cut. And similarly, we have a valuation level that we want to get to where we want to add. And we're starting to get closer and closer to those levels. Um, so if you think about our long-term kind of asset allocation at about 65, but we're currently sitting at 54. And in fact, um, depending on what sentiment is, we could be a little bit lower within the next few days. And then all we'll be watching for is one, either the market to get cheap enough, so we'll start slowly adding back to at least 65. And finally, the second big thing that we want to change is the sentiment. Um, so as often, we don't ignore sentiment in China. And sentiment is a little bit, um, we all know about the Archego is blowing up. We've seen these mania stocks starting to correct, right? And what's been happening is that people have been concentrated into these mania stocks and creating a little bit of fear in the market because you start losing money, um, whether it's foreign hedge funds or Chinese fund managers and active managers specifically in China. Not so much quant or passive managers, but active managers have been hurt a lot uh, because you can imagine if you're only holding 20 stocks, which is what most active portfolios are, top 10, whatever, making up 60, 70% of the portfolio, and five of your top 10 is correcting 30 to 40%, um, then all of a sudden it creates a pause, it creates a bit of fear. Uh, but we do think that the overall market, especially if you look at earnings as a whole, is growing extremely well. You have the strongest economy in a decade, the earnings are going to come through. And as the sentiment changes, we will add. Now we change that very, very quickly. Um, so you've always seen that in China, that when the market change direction, it moves incredibly quickly. You're talking about, you know, in rallies are 15 to 20 percent in a week and it'll happen over two weeks. Um, you know, it's happened twice a year. So kind of if you're timing the Chinese market slowly, it is so difficult to do because you, you're not in the Chinese market for two weeks. You missed out the entire gain of the year. You know, the entire year is like up 35 percent, looks great, but you actually had to be there over those two weeks. Um, and I think that's a benefit of us being on the ground. We do it daily and now models are tried and tested and can capture those type of moves when it happens. Perfect, and maybe just staying on the equity carve out of the fund, I mean, can you maybe position, um, you know, there's a few questions asked about CSI 300 versus 
um, MSCI China, and how do those two compare with from a holdings perspective? Actually, in that carve out, you know, whether it be ten cent Alibaba and stuff like that, or you know, as a South African investor, what is your benefit of rather going CSI three hundred like the China fund versus MSCI China? Sounds good. I'll let Ken answer a bit of that. So yeah, so uh, we choose the mainland CSI 300 benchmark because uh, so it's firstly it's a it's a benchmark of 300 stocks, 300 Chinese companies that are listed within mainland China, a much much more diversified and much more representative group of stocks of the Chinese economy. MSCI China, on the other hand, uh, is what we consider China offshore. Uh, so it is very tech heavy, very finance heavy. So it's obviously got your major names such as Tencent, Alibaba, and it's got a lot of banking stocks, a lot of tech stocks, uh, and companies, Chinese companies that are listed, listed offshore outside of China. Um, so the difference, uh, two major differences. One is MSCI China is easy, easily accessible by foreign investors, uh, but CSI 300 is not. So uh, President has uh, what we call a QP license, a Qualified Foreign Institutional Investor license that allows us to bypass the capital controls of China and invest freely into mainland China, moving capital in and out without restriction. Uh, but MSCI China does not require that. Uh, but obviously MSCI China's makeup is very different, as I mentioned, is very finance and tech, tech heavy. Uh, the top 10 stocks of the MSCI China index make up about 50% of the index. So you get a lot of concentration in terms of both sector and at individual counter level. Whereas the CSR 300, the top 10 stocks represent about a quarter of the index. So a much more diversified index. And in terms of historical correlation to the JSC, so standing from a South African investor perspective, uh, the MSCI China correlation varies anywhere between 45 and 75% to the JSC. So probably largely contributed by companies like Tencent and uh, companies like Nasdaq's uh, in the JSC where the stock price movements move exactly in sync. Um, and also, uh, on the other hand, the CSI 300 is correlation to the JSC. So from a South African investment perspective, again, the correlations vary anywhere between 15 to 30 percent historically. So this is talking about five year long term correlation numbers. So if we look at mainland China, uh, the benefit we feel is that you get a much better representative of the overall Chinese economy, no sector concentration. It's a much more diversified index. And from a South African investor perspective, uh, as part of your global portfolio, the CSI 300 presents a much better uh, diversification allocation as part of the South African investor's portfolio. I think Ken's absolutely right. And I think certainly back to that mania thing, right? I think if you look at MSCI China, it just reminds you of that. Um, you know, that thing is you know, hero or zero, right? It could go, everything could go great, everything could go well. Um, these companies will be allowed to eat up every single company in the world, and all of a sudden this thing will go absolutely shooting to the moon. Um, vice versa, you see what happened with the Alibaba um, government clamped down. Uh, antitrust is becoming a bigger and bigger thing, not just in China and around the world. Um, there's a lot of laws that are kind of going to come down, right? Uh, the fines is a small thing, the fines is not the big thing. The big thing is all these um, anti-competitive measures are going to be stopped going forward, right? So going forward, you're no longer to do this. So now you're concentrating these stocks with huge PE ratios, with huge expectation of growth, and government saying, wait a second, we're going to take a look of your growth, whether this is good growth or is this bad growth? Is this monopoly growth? Is this you taking other things? So coming to us, especially to me, I think this MSCI China, they're great companies, but you know, there's an element of risk there. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have them. Um, they, they have a place for them. There's a great thing for them. Um, but for us, it just feels like the CSR 300, our process, um, the diversification benefits, the, um, the asset allocation, so all of that putting together just feels like a much smoother path to good real returns out of the cycle um, than kind of a more riskier, but potentially much higher return path. Great. And then you, you slightly touched on it a little bit there, Liang. I mean, How's the regulatory conflict, you know, panning out between these tech companies and the Chinese government at the moment? I mean, are, are we going to see it, you know, hamper the markets over the short term, or is this going to be put to bed quite quickly? I don't think this can be put to bed quite quickly. Um, I think that's impossible. I think so. The, it's a very obvious a regulator fired the first salvo um, and saying that we're just we're not, you know, the Chinese regulator is not going to be the U.S. regulator. We're not going to stand aside and let you do what you want to do. Right, so you are going to be allowed to 
um, provide a good service, and you should provide service. There's certain economies of scale, certain efficiency that is gained by these large companies. Um, but the regulators are warning them on two fronts. Number one, especially on the financial side, um, you're not going to be allowed to create wild leverage. You're not going to be able to create financial risk. Um, you're not going to be doing, um, you know, there's a, it's not limiting innovation. It's limiting silly innovation. Uh, you know, you, one of the things they stopped them doing, for example, is absolutely crazy, is a regulator fine, um, and financial for giving students loans, right? So they were literally offering university students 50,000 to 100,000 loans, and then students, as, as they would, will go to each platform and borrow from another platform to pay back the first platform and repeatedly cycle this, right? And then all these um, financial companies were not even creating uh, capital to protect against this. So I think it's very, very clear to me that, um, you know, most certainly the regulators are have their eyes open now and they're going to keep very very careful track of what you're doing so you'll no longer be able to make these uh, quick profits at the cost of the government so things go wrong governments can bail you out the thing comes right you make a lot of profit for yourself um, and that immediately means that to me at least of the you have to look at the growth rate and really think about what is a realistic growth rate for these companies um, going forward uh, so that's what we see. But on the other hand, I must say, it doesn't mean that this is going to be the end of these companies. Certainly not. Um, they will, you know, they'll have all the freedom to operate, et cetera, et cetera. But they're just not going to be allowed to abuse the market uh, that all these tech companies have done, both in China and in the US. Yes, I think there's one more question that's come in here now that I think you've relatively answered there. You know, a lot of sort of South African asset, asset managers would comment, you know, saying, negatively on SA's China auditing structure and it's been black box and stuff like that. I think that's it's come and gone or it's at least evolving as times go with China. I mean, it's still quite a young and, and new sort of system in place. Um, you know, if anything you want to add to that. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's long come and gone. I think um, the Chinese, so it's very, very interesting, right? So they said the entire last year, the US SEC uh, did 58 cases, so the regulators did 58 cases of financial market regulation, uh, financial market enforcement, right? This is the number for China last year was 4,400. So over 4,400 actions were taken by the financial regulators in China against different actors in the entire industry. And what it's telling us is that the regulators are doing a lot of work. Uh, they levied record fines, actually billions in fines, which helped the regulators have a bigger budget to continue to tackle this. Um, so China is developing extremely fast and the market is cleaning up very, very nicely. Uh, I think the eight years we've been in China, I think we've already gone through three cycles. And with every cycle, things just get better and cleaner and more efficient, more professional. Um, the entire market has changed. The players in the market has changed. You know, it's going from old school cowboy like players or to university PhD um, students or studied overseas and understanding the, um, these type of things. So I think the accounting framework, everything has changed dramatically, um, just like South Africa, you know, we've had our accounting scandals, um, you know, the accounting companies had to be cleaned up. But I think the regulators have been extremely active in China and the pace of improvement is very, very fast. Yeah. So uh, I Sorry, just to, to add to Liang's point, I think historically, if we look at all the major sort of publicized uh, Chinese for fraud, uh, fraudulent Chinese companies, many of them were actually reverse mergers in the US rather than uh, outright fraud for companies that are listed inside China. So uh, the, the type of sort of dodgy accounting practice is much, much more difficult uh, to do within China than outside of China when, when there's two different regulatory authorities needing to, to interlink almost. So, yeah, as Dan says, it's, it's much, much more improved. And I think uh, as starters, it's, it's always been much less risky for Chinese companies listed in China as well. Yeah, I think also maybe to give investors a bit of peace of mind is that, you know, things move a lot quicker there. So when, when you are in the wrong, you're in the wrong and you, you punish quite quickly. I think when you think of a South African market, it tends to drag out. Um, and no one actually ever gets held accountable. I think at least in China, these things do happen quite quickly. Um, and then maybe just lastly in wrapping up here, um, you know, we speak a lot about the equity carve out of the fund. Maybe can you just talk a little bit about the other components, you know, um, obviously the flexible fund, um, flexible fund and the, you know, bond and fixed income assets in there. You know, how do you manage those assets? Um, and then maybe on top of that, obviously, your exposure, does it only come through China or are there other EM baskets in there as well? 
Um, you know, I know we, we look at a bit of Hong Kong, but maybe can you just touch on that as well, please? Sure. Um, I think from our side, starting with the fixed income, um, you know, pressing always have an extremely deep fixed income process. And here, uh, here in China, it's exactly the same. I think to summarize, we want to get compensated for the risks that we take. So if you think about something like the balance fund, where we're allocating away from, from equities, what we're looking at is some place to be safe. So currently, we're mostly investing in money market instruments, government bonds, um, and development banks, and that's it. And the reason behind that is very, very simple. Credit spreads in China is very, very low, um, and we think there's so much risk out there in credit. Uh, we think there's so many, um, the credit market has already cleaned out a lot, uh, but that we think there's still going to be some more cleaning out to do before the risks are fairly priced in the Chinese market. So one thing we are looking at very carefully is, of course, as we mentioned earlier, China already had one of the highest yields in the developed world. And if that yield starts going even higher and the real yield starts to get really attractive, what we're looking to do is to increase duration. Um, so, I mean, it's very, very minor and we, we don't talk much about it, but I think if you look a year ago when, you know, the COVID happened, our duration of fixed income portfolio is probably around 0 0.2 years. And we're currently already at 1.2 years. Right, and we're going to take that up to four or five if the opportunity arises. I think that's a crucial thing, if the opportunity arises, if the long-term yield starts going up. And finally, um, in terms of other EMs, I think we're a China fund. We focus on China. I think um, you know people can get EM where they want to get EM. The only time we invest outside of China, I think, is in Hong Kong. And that's also because um, Hong Kong shares in China has traded at a massive discount relative to Chinese shares. And that also started recovering over the first quarter. Um, so I think, you know, everything ties back to those mania stocks. In the in the fourth quarter last year, those mania stocks are flying. Reasonable stocks in Hong Kong stock gets cheaper and cheaper. Whereas in the first quarter, it was the exact opposite. So first quarter alone, our Hong Kong stocks um, outperformed the market by around 6%, um, you know, relatively just first quarter alone. Now we think that around 30% there, uh, between 30 to 40% there. Um, so that's why we do have an allocation to Hong Kong. But as always, we're very, very well diversified. We're very um, you know, risk diversified. Um, so we don't have a huge position in Hong Kong. It's just merely Chinese companies that trade at an unbelievable value sitting in Hong Kong. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think that's a wrap for today. Um, if you do have any more questions or comments or, or need any further information, please reach out to one of us or your consultants at Prescient. Um, and we will be popping through the uh, recording of the presentation in a few days time if you want to share it on with any of your clients or other colleagues in the office. Um, and until then, um, have a fantastic weekend and we'll chat soon. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone.